All right, welcome to module 3.4. We're moving away from looking at the atom now. We're actually going to look at the periodic table. We're going to look at how we take those atoms of different elements and how we arrange them into the periodic table. So we're going to get started with that. And we're going to start off by looking at the history of the periodic table. So if we've uh, rewound about 2000 years ago, really, there'd only be about 10 elements that people could identify for you. And those are ones that, you know, you're probably going to find them naturally in the ground. Things like sulfur, zinc, gold, mercury, tin, copper, carbon, iron, silver, and lead. Um, these are ones, some of them are pretty um, unreactive, so you find big nuggets of them like gold and silver. Um, or other ones are really um, identifiable and that sort of thing and easy to extract. So only about 10 elements had actually been identified. It doesn't mean, though, that these were the only ones that existed. It just means that we hadn't identified the other ones yet because maybe they were joined to other compounds and that sort of thing in different uh, molecules. Fast forwarding uh, about 1800 years, and we've now discovered sort of over 50 elements, which is very exciting. Uh, what's interesting to think is our periodic table today actually has 118 elements on it. So that's another sort of 68 elements that in the past 200 years have been discovered or even synthesized. Uh, when I say synthesized, that means made in the lab. So we've actually made them ourselves. So we've done a lot more in the past uh, sort of 200 years than we did in the 1800 before that, but it was definitely uh, an exciting time. Now, um, the periodic table hasn't always existed. So obviously, you know, um, in the 1800s, we might have just been starting to think about creating a periodic table and arranging our 50 elements or so. But before that, you wouldn't have had one because you wouldn't have had enough information to put into one. So chemists were looking for patterns and ways to organize these elements. And in 1864, uh, John Newlands arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic weight. Now, this is important because that's not actually what we do today, but that's all they could do at the time. They could weigh things and they could do it uh, by a weight. And what he did when he did this, or sorry, what he discovered rather when he did this is that every eighth element actually shared similar properties. So it goes to element one, then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then come around back to nine. And it would do things like number one did. And you keep going through and you see these patterns that they behave in certain ways. Maybe you put them in water and they react the same, or maybe they were always, um, you know, a gas or, or something like that. Um, so it was really interesting for him to see that and, and other scientists saw it as well. But the problem with this is chemists were struggling to come up with a perfect arrangement because you'd get these patterns, but you'd get inconsistency. So there'd be areas where the pattern wouldn't work and some atom would come in and have different properties and they'd be like, ah, oh, it's, it's a pain, it's not fitting. Well, uh, in 1869, a gentleman with the most fantastic name of Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev or Mendeleev uh, decided to actually ignore the inconsistencies. And that was a big deal because scientists at the time, you know, they thought they kind of knew quite a bit. And it's hard to ignore uh, those inconsistencies and to and to do what he did. Um, he did something similar, though. He put the elements into rows and we call those rows periods. Uh, and they were also were in columns and the columns are called groups. And he, like John Newlands, did this in order of increasing atomic weight. But he did something different. You can see here we've got um, we've got an example of Mendeleev's or Mendeleev's uh, periodic table. And you can see these dashes throughout. And these dashes are what's so important because that's where he's decided to say, you know what, I think it's inconsistent because we don't know something. I think maybe we're missing something here. And so I'm actually going to put space in and I'm going to make the elements we do know about. I'm going to make them fit the pattern. And I'm just going to put spaces in between to fill it up um, so that they do fit the pattern and that sort of thing. Um, and I've got a great video here that actually goes through this uh, in detail. So we're going to watch that now. The periodic table is instantly recognizable. It's not just in every chemistry lab worldwide. It's found on t-shirts, coffee mugs, and shower curtains. But the periodic table isn't just another trendy icon. It's a massive slab of human genius. Up there with the Taj Mahal, the Mona Lisa, and the ice cream sandwich. And the table's creator, Dmitry Mendeleev, is a bona fide science hall of famer. But why? What's so great about him and his table? Is it because he made a comprehensive list of the known elements? Nah, you don't earn a spot in Science Valhalla just for making a list. Besides, Mendeleev was far from the first person to do that. Is it because Mendeleev arranged elements with similar properties together? Not really, that had already been done too. So what was Mendeleev's genius? Let's look at one of the first versions of the periodic table from around 1870. Here we see elements designated by their two letter symbols arranged in a table. Check out the entry at the third column, fifth row. There's a dash there. From that unassuming placeholder springs the raw brilliance of Mendeleev. That dash 
is science. By putting that dash there, Dimitri was making a bold statement. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, y'all haven't discovered this element yet. In the meantime, I'm going to give it a name. It's one step away from aluminum, so we'll call it Eka aluminum. Eka being Sanskrit for one. Nobody's found Eka aluminum yet, so we don't know anything about it, right? Wrong. Based on where it's located, I can tell you all about it. First of all, an atom of Eka aluminum has an atomic weight of 68, about 68 times heavier than a hydrogen atom. When Eka aluminum is isolated, you'll see it's a solid metal at room temperature. It's shiny, it conducts heat really well, it can be flattened into a sheet, stretched into a wire, but its melting point is low, like freakishly low. Oh, and a cubic centimeter of it will weigh six grams. Mendeleev could predict all of these things simply from where the blank spot was and his understanding of how the elements surrounding it behaved. A few years after this prediction, a French guy named Paul Emile Lecoq de Bois Baudrin discovered a new element in ore samples and named it gallium after Gaul, the historical name for France. Gallium is one step away from aluminum on the periodic table. It's Eka aluminum. So were Mendeleev's predictions right? Gallium's atomic weight is 69.72. A cubic centimeter of it weighs 5.9 grams. It's a solid metal at room temperature, but it melts at a paltry 30 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. It melts in your mouth and in your hand. Not only did Mendeleev completely nail gallium, he predicted other elements that were unknown at the time. Scandium, germanium, rhenium. The element he called echomanganese is now called technetium. Technetium is so rare, it couldn't be isolated until it was synthesized in a cyclotron in 1937, almost 70 years after Dimitri predicted its existence, 30 years after he died. Dimitri died without a Nobel Prize in 1907, but he wound up receiving a much more exclusive honor. In 1955, scientists at UC Berkeley successfully created 17 atoms of a previously undiscovered element. This element filled an empty spot in the periodic table at number 101, and was officially named Mendelevium in 1963. There have been well over 800 Nobel Prize winners, but only 15 scientists have an element named after them. So the next time you stare at a periodic table, whether it's on the wall of a university classroom or on a $5 coffee mug, Dmitry Mendeleev, the architect of the periodic table, will be staring back. So. And getting into that, um, just really quickly, I thought I'd pause and talk about why don't we call it a periodic table? Um, so it might be something you thought about, maybe you've never thought about it. Well, like we were saying, each column has elements that have similar chemical properties. And the way those uh, properties occur is we see them occurring in patterns, or rather they seem to happen uh, repeatedly, um, or regular periods, or we might say periodically. So because these patterns reoccur at regular intervals or they occur periodically, like you might say, well, I go to the shops periodically, it's every so often, um, we actually say it's a periodic table. Okay, so periodic table is actually telling you that there are patterns that are reoccurring at set intervals. So the periodic law would be that when elements are listed in order of increasing atomic weight, we see properties of the elements reoccur at regular intervals. When we put them in order of increasing atomic weight, there are properties that create these patterns, that they reoccur at regular intervals. That's what we're calling it periodic table for. Now, like the video was saying, Mendeleev left gaps in the, his periodic table for what were yet undiscovered elements that he predicted had existed or did exist. Um, the video talked about gallium, but another one would be germanium. And that was another one where he predicted it had all these properties he said it was going to have. And, you know, sure enough, 15 years later, they discovered it and he was right. And he was able to do this by looking at around that missing element, looking at the other elements. What were their masses? What were the properties they had? And because of that, he was able then to predict what the one that was missing would be like. Um, how did it fit into the pattern? All right. So... Fast forward a little bit further, and by 1925, all what we'd say are naturally occurring elements have been found. So at this point, by 1925, if you want to find a new element, you're going to have to make it in a lab yourself. Um, it's just not out there in nature anymore. Uh, and this has continued on. It certainly in 1925 wasn't the end. In fact, a couple of years ago, we actually um, added more elements to the periodic table because they've been formally identified, named, uh, and everything. 
So elements are arranged on the periodic table from left to right. Um, so we start up the top on the top left-hand corner with hydrogen, and we finish down the bottom left-hand corner with a new element, um, organesson. I don't know how to say that. It's new. I'm still working my head around it. Um, but we go left to right in order of increasing atomic number. Now, this is where things are different because it used to be atomic weight. So we now do it. We now do it in terms of increasing atomic number. An atomic number, I hope you remember, is how many protons it has. So it starts with hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton. Then it goes helium, which is two. Lithium, three protons. Beryllium, four. So it, each time it goes up by one. Um, and um, it's really clear. As long as you've gone up by one, you've not missed anything. Okay. And each time we have a new electron shell, we're going to start a new row on the table. So that's something we covered earlier as well. Um, if you know how many... Uh, shells it has, you know what row it's in, or if you know what row it's in, you know how many electron shells that atom is going to have. So some of the information you can get off the periodic table we've got here. Um, you're going to get the atomic number, which like we said, number of protons in the atom. Um, so you're going to have the name. So here we can see, you know, you've got hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen, helium, so that's the name. Then you've got uh, a letter, which is your symbol. So it might just be a single letter like hydrogen. It's just a capital H. Or it might be uh, a two letters, H-E. If you've got two letters, there's always a capital followed by a lower case. Um, really handy if you're ever looking at a um, sort of chemical formula, like H2O or um, NaCl. Every time you have a capital letter, that is the start of a new symbol. Okay, and any little letter goes with one before it. It's really important that you're aware of this. And one thing some people muck up is they'll think that this, which is CO, is the same as CO, like that. This is carbon, and this is also a capital O, so this is oxygen. But this, on the other hand, this is one thing. This is cobalt. And this is why it's really important to be clear when you're writing to make sure, are you trying to talk about two things or one thing? Do you need two capital letters or is it a capital and a lowercase? Um, and that's one I've seen a number of times that people get wrong and they'll write the wrong thing because they're being lazy and they forget to make their O capital and they mean um, oxygen, but they've just turned it into cobalt. So be very careful of that as you're looking at things. So you're going to have the name, the symbol, you're going to have the atomic number, which is number of protons, and you're also going to have the uh, either relative, relative atomic mass or um, atomic mass number or mass number or whatever it might say on there. Now, you need to remember that atoms are neutral and the number of protons is going to be equal to the number of uh, electrons. This is something we've mentioned earlier. So atomic number in an atom will also tell you how many electrons it has. Now, hopefully you remember if electrons are gained or lost by an atom, it becomes a ion so it's then going to have an electrical charge uh, i hope you remember that one it is very important to know so this is sort of what we're talking about here you've got your atomic number an atom symbol an atom's name and its mass there and the atomic number is the number of protons um, or, and in an atom the number of electrons the mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons on a periodic table you might get this being a decimal number because uh, a few videos ago we talked about how it's actually um uh, sort of a weighted average so it's not uh it perfectly for just one atom it's actually for the best descriptor we have for all those different isotopes so um, it, you can look at specific ones and what you'll find is the number is going to be um, closest to whatever is the most common isotope of that element all right um, you might also see things written like this where you have the um on the right where you have the a the e and the z now if you see something like this the e is um, being a placeholder here for the symbol of the element. So that could be H for hydrogen or HE for helium or, or whatever it is. The number here that um, A is representing, that's the mass number. Uh, and Z is going to be the atomic number. Now, if you see this and you cannot remember which way around it was, which is the mass number and which is the atomic number, um, the mass number will always be the bigger number. The only exception to this is when you are talking about hydrogen. And in that case, it doesn't matter at all because both numbers will probably be one. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one you pick. All right, they're both is one, <laughs> or both are one. So if you can't remember which is atomic number and which is mass number, it is going to be uh, the bigger number is the mass number. All right, and for those who've forgotten, mass number is going to be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. All right, 
Getting your head around atomic mass is really important because it's the sort of thing where you might be asked, you know, how many neutrons does this have? And you'll be given atomic number and mass number. And you have to remember from that that you need to take the atomic number away from the mass number to get the number of neutrons. So the mass of an atom really does just come down to those protons and neutrons because they're so much bigger than electrons. Electrons are um, so tiny, they just don't count. Now, not all atoms of an element are exactly the same, and this is where the isotopes we've talked about before come in. Isotopes, remember, atoms of the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons, and therefore they're going to have different mass numbers. So the mass that you calculate is actually a weighted average, as we were saying before, and it's based on how abundant each isotope is. The more you have of that version, the more, um, or the closer rather, to that isotope's mass that your final weighted average is going to be. So that number on the periodic table, um, that's going to be closest to whichever isotope occurs the most. So if you have one that occurs 90% of the time, 90% of all hydrogen, for example, is this kind of hydrogen, then your um mass number on the periodic table is going to be closest to that hydrogen's mass number. It'll maybe be a little bit higher or a bit lower because of how it's been affected by other ones, but it's going to be closest to the one that there is most of. Okay. If that, hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, don't stress too much. Just understand that when you're looking at the periodic table, that the reason it's a decimal is because it's not a perfect mass number. Um, and if we're talking about neutrons or anything like that in a test or something like that, you will probably get told or you should get told uh, what the mass number we want you to work with actually is, um, because otherwise it's very difficult to do that. All right, we're actually at the end of the uh, PowerPoint here. Now, it can, like it says there, it can be um, pretty tricky reading the periodic table. Not everything works the way you think it is going to when it comes to symbols, like hydrogen and helium make sense. But when you look at something like lead, which is PB, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and there's a lot of elements, like I said, there's 118. So it's good to spend a little bit of time with them and getting your head around the different names that are out there and the different elements that exist. So what you can do to help yourself with this, there is an elements name uh, worksheet that you can download and grab and go through and fill in. Um, the only thing to be wary of with that worksheet is it's written from an American perspective. So if it says, um, you know, what element is named after one of our states, it's talking about an American state. Same for if it says what element is named or has the same name as one of our coins, that means an American coin. So not Australian. Um, so just keep that in your head as you're completing it. But it's a very helpful worksheet for getting your head around that. Um, and particularly why some elemental symbols don't match with an element's name. So you can go off and do that in your own time. There should be answers available to that as well um, for you to download and check off with. But uh, as for this video, that's all for this. Um, if there's anything you didn't understand, you feel free to go back, rewatch it, um, speed it up, slow it down, jump just through the bits you want to watch again, whatever you need to do. And if you've still got questions, remember to ask your teacher. They're more than happy to help you with it. Uh, that's it for this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.